I'm preaching on righteousness today, and last time I preached on joy, and we did four or five breaks of joy. You remember that? Oh, yeah, how could you forget? Yeah. And I thought about doing breaks of righteousness. And then I thought about it, and I didn't know what that would look like. Would people, like, you know, run across the aisle and saying, you know, I just need to get this off my chest. I need to be right before God. I've hated you forever. <laughs> you did this to me 10 years ago, and I've been holding on to it ever since. So instead of that, because I, I said, no, I'm not going to do that, and a couple people have said, oh. And so because a few of you have betrayed you and seem to like the breaks of joy, I figured, why don't we just go ahead and do it? I realize you just got situated. I'm sorry. But could you do something for me, please? Could you go ahead and stand up? I want you to find one person who you haven't spoke to today and either A, give them a hug, or B, a high five, or a handshake if, like, if, you're, if your personal bubble says, hey, I don't like people hugging me at random, you can go ahead and say, hey, no, no, give me a high five. So go ahead, find one person, and then stay with that person. Oh, no. oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Rocky. Thanks, brother. Okay, stay with that person. Now, I want you to, to sit there or stand there, whichever you prefer, with that person, and I want you to confess to one another the last thing that God told you to do that you actually did. The last thing that you know that God said, do this, and you did it. If you're having difficulty, we're in trouble. All right. Go ahead. Resume your normal seats. You can sit with your families. It's okay. Get comfortable. Get your cup of coffee. All right. Honesty time. Show of hands. Who had trouble thinking of something? I mean, seriously, be honest, you know. If put on the spot, I would have trouble. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's not great. I mean, let's be honest, that's bad. If we're having trouble remembering the last thing that God told us to do, how much time are we spending with God? How closely are we listening? Or worse, if you can remember the last thing God told you to do, and you remembered, oh, I haven't done it yet. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. But right now, why don't you go ahead and grab your Bibles, stand up, uh, just exercise people, up, down, up, down. Grab your Bible, we're going to read the Word. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. All right, as one, all aloud. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying... I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son, who fulfilled all righteousness. Lord, who calls us to live in righteousness. Lord, you call us to be imitators of your Son. Lord, may we take that seriously. May every aspect of our hearts, every aspect of our lives, follow you, Lord. May our hearts hunger to know you and to do your will. In your name, amen. Be seated, please. So there's a couple things going on on here. And so it's, it's interesting for me because usually when I, I preach, I'll pick a passage or God's been working on my heart and, and I'll pick something. But here at Cornerstone, we have a message calendar. And so I just get kind of assigned a date, and I love it because I don't know what I'm going to preach on. And then I figure it out and go, wow, I probably wouldn't have picked that passage. That requires a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it 
there's a lot going on there. I mean, you could, I mean, if you, when you, when you take all the tools and stuff that they give us in seminary, which, by the way, seminary is not necessary, so if you feel like you have to go to seminary to, to understand the Bible, totally not true. In fact, seminary will probably usually mess with your head more than it will help you. Am I right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Same here. Breaks of joy. I mean, okay. So the truth is, there's a ton going on in this passage. There's a lot, and we could spend a lot of time talking about it. But I want to hone in on just a couple things that are really applicable for us, that we need to hear, and that the Lord has shared that we have to hear. We have to be serious about this. So the first thing that's going on, you know, we talked last week, Pastor Joe shared, about just John the Baptist, and he prepared the way for Christ. And, and we were getting ready. And so when this happens, when Jesus comes to John for his baptism, this is the beginning. This is the starting of Christ's ministry. This is the starting of the three years of Christ's changing existence. Amen? Changing the nature of our relationship with God. Changing the way that we relate to him. Changing the way that God sees us. I mean, it's, it's powerful, it's heavy, it, it's, you can just feel it. When you read this passage, something big is happening. And then right after this, Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tested. So, I mean, this is a huge part. This is the beginning, this is the start, this is, this is the, 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 you know, setting off of Christ's ministry on earth. And Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Now, John was giving a, a water baptism. And in, in, the, in the Hebrew world, water baptism was more of a cleansing ritual. So usually, they would baptize people that were proselytites or Gentiles that wanted to become Jewish. So they weren't Jewish by blood. Okay, so they weren't Israelites. They weren't Hebrew. They were just Gentiles. You know, they were whatever. They were us, you know. And so they wanted to follow God. And so they would cleanse them in the water. And it was symbolic and it was powerful and it was ritual. But John, John is offering a different baptism. He's offering a baptism not only to Gentiles. He's offering it to everybody. He's offering it to the Hebrews as well. And you say, well, why? I thought they didn't need it. His baptism was a baptism of repentance. See, John got it. God gave John clarity. That it wasn't about where you were born. That being a child of God had nothing to do with your bloodline or your pedigree or your parents' faith. It had everything to do with your faith. It had everything to do with your choice. Baptism is for a believer. Baptism is a sign of saying, I am done with sin. I turn my back on it. I repent of evil and I will follow God. Amen? That's baptism. I love baptism. That's why we're Baptist. Baptist, was, Baptist became a denomination because baptism is a central part of getting ready and starting your life with God. Amen? But why is Jesus getting baptized? A, he was Jewish, so he wasn't a Gentile needing to be baptized. And B, he had nothing to repent of. He was sinless. He was perfect. And so John knows this. John says, wait, I was preparing the way for you. You're the one that will baptize with fire and with the Holy Spirit. You're the real deal. I'm just, I'm just like the appetizer. You're the full meal deal. I will use a lot of food analogies today. <laughs> Probably because A, I forgot to eat breakfast, and B, because I love food. Yeah, I love food. So John goes, why? Actually, no, I need to be baptized by you. And he did. And Jesus said, let us do this. For it is proper to fulfill all righteousness. Now again, there's a lot of things that we could talk about about what that means. We could talk about prophecy. Can we pull up uh, Isaiah 53, 12, please? Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was fulfilling prophecy. 
He was being numbered with the transgressors. He was taking the baptism for the sinners, for the unclean, upon himself. And we could talk about that. But you know what? Read Isaiah 53. The whole thing is prophetic. It's amazing. Just read it. So why? Why is Jesus doing that? He's sinless. He has no need of repentance. What's it about? To fulfill all righteousness. Psalm 40, 6 through 8. Can we pull that up? Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Let's leave that up there. That's a powerful passage. It's a wonderful passage. We should take that all as our mandate. That we should desire to do the will of God. When we think of righteousness... I mean, what, what comes to mind? When you think of righteousness as we usually define it, someone be brave, audience participation, give me an answer. A wonderful, selfless person. So right relationship with others. That's good. What else? So one word starts with an L, ends with an awe. Law. That's right. Righteousness is the smackdown of God. <laughs> I, don't quote me on that. I don't know if that's theologically correct. Yeah, we, when, when the church views righteousness, a lot of times we think of it as, okay, living according to the law of God. Living according to his commands. Now, the people of the day, especially... The Pharisees and Sadducees, remember they came to John and he called them a brood of vipers. So you can call people names in the Bible. It's okay as long as you do it under the Holy Spirit. Maybe you shouldn't quote me on that either. <laughs> but they came to him and, you know, the thing that the Pharisees and Sadducees, remember the Pharisees, they get a bad rap. They were not bad. You know, the Pharisees' greatest sin was that they were zealous about doing the will of God. They thought they had an understanding of what God required of them, and so they were gung-ho sold out for it. And they were so gung-ho and sold out for it, they trampled over Jesus in the process. We do the same thing all the time. We get so wrapped up in our religion that we trample over faith. We get so wrapped up with our have-tos that we miss relationship with God. We think of righteousness sometimes as being just being, being sold out and gung-ho about doing the will of God. And you know what? That's all true. But there has to be a, 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 a huge key component. Your heart has to be engaged. Your heart has to be engaged. It can't just be a, a checklist of law, a checklist of commands from God of do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And if you just spend your life going down that checklist, that's how we become Pharisees. That's how we become people so wrapped up in being righteous. We forget to be children of God. That we forget to be like him. So what is righteousness? For one thing, Jesus didn't have to get baptized. He didn't have to. He wasn't needing this water baptism by John. He didn't have to. But it was the will of his Father. And the thing that we see about Jesus throughout the Gospels is Jesus had a hunger to do the will of the Father. Jesus was about the will of his Father every step of the way. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we think of righteousness as a buffet. We, we, we Pastors, we love this, exp, uh, this analogy. I love it just because I love food again. But we think of righteousness or we think of doing God's will as a buffet table. And so we look at it and we go and we want a bunch. You know, we want to get our money's worth. But we pick and choose. We say, God, okay, you know what? I, I, I love forgiveness. 
And so I want forgiveness. I, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want forgiveness for sins. Yes, I want eternal life. Take some of that. I'll take some grace. And uh, you know what? I'll take some mercy. And I'll take some love. But faithfulness? Yeah, I'm not, not too fond of that one. I'm going to go ahead. Why don't we leave that one there? It's not, a, it's not a buffet table where you get to pick and choose only what you like. Have you ever noticed? So the staff... I'm going to go ahead and out us a little bit. We, we talked about it a little bit. We're, we're going to do like a healthy contest. We talked about losing weight, but then we realized that some of us <laughs> don't have any weight to lose. <laughs> so we thought about assigning negative pounds. I didn't realize that wouldn't work. So we just came up with, okay, whatever would be healthy for you. So if it's losing weight, great. If it's better cardio performance, great. If it's lower cholesterol, great. You know, any of those things are good. Amen? All right. So that's great. So in, to prepare for this, others are thinking about what they're going to eat and how they're going to eat right. Anton and I are gearing up to just gorge ourselves before the start date. <laughs> So we've been like, you know, it, while in staff, we're just sitting there working, you know, and, and doing spiritual things. And then we talk about, where's the best buffet? I mean, is there qu quality versus quantity? Where is it? And Anton's got this down to a science. I love Anton. Anton and I, God brought us together to experience community through food. That's just one of the reasons. And the staff can attest to this. Whole staff meetings can be derailed because we'll just be in our own world talking about food for a second. As much as I love buffets, and I really love buffets, as much as I love them, there's great ones, there's okay ones, there's bang for your buck ones. I really love prefix menus. Looks like price fix. So that's where a chef has set the price, set the components. You have no option. And it's coming. There's a restaurant down in Napa, um, kind of close to where Jess and I lived. It's in Yauntville, actually. It's called the French Laundry. Anybody ever heard of it? Thomas Keller's restaurant. It was voted two years in a row as best restaurant in the world. Three Michelin stars. Some of you are going, you know way too much about food. <laughs> I really don't. I just know that I like it. But the French Laundry, you have to be on a waiting list for sometimes two to six months to even get in. And I've never been, and here's the reason, it's $270 a plate. And as much as I love food, the thought <laughs> of, you know, because after you get done with the wine and the corkage fee and all the, the gratuities, you're looking at, for two people, it's close to $1,000. But it's like a three and a half to four hour experience, sometimes longer. Because they don't, there's a couple things that they do. A, they know what they're serving. I mean, these are master chefs, craftsmen. These are people who have devoted their lives to creating something exciting for your palate, something that will take you on a journey to a new place. I'm, I know it sounds weird. I'm quoting them. <laughs> Believe me, it could get weirder if I quoted more, but I'm not going to. Some people, their, their experience with food is just a little too visceral. <laughs> But, I mean, oh, you know, you go and, and you go to one of these places and you sit down and they bring you a morsel of goodness and you eat it and you experience it and then on their time when they're ready, they bring you something else. You don't have a choice. You don't get to substitute. You don't get to say, uh, I'm not a fan of the foie gras. Could I get an extra helping of the bacon, you know, mashed potatoes or something? You don't get to do that. They have perfectly crafted what's going to be given to you to fulfill the whole experience, to bring you to a new place. Righteousness is the same way. It's not a buffet table. We don't get to pick and choose. Righteousness is crafted by the master craftsman at righteousness, the only one who truly knows what it's about, God. And God gives us things to do, not because we get to pick and choose, because he has crafted it perfectly for your life at your time to be taken then, not later. And here's the fun part about righteousness. Here's the fun part about doing the will of God. The courses stop if you don't eat. 
to take it out of the analogy, if God has given you something to do, if God has told you and told your heart, and maybe right now, maybe when we did the little illustration and we all got together, maybe you were having trouble of thinking, you know, what, what, is, what has God told me recently to do that I haven't done? But maybe it was easy because it's been gnawing at you. And maybe you're sitting here tonight, sorry, today, it feels like night. And it's been bothering you for a while. You know God has been calling you towards something. You know God has been telling you what to do, and you know who you are. And you haven't done it. And maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month, maybe it's years. And you've been wondering why your relationship with God has been stymied. Or you wonder why you're not reaching new plateaus of understanding with God. Or you wonder why your understanding of the Spirit, the, the spirit and the Word ha- has been stagnated. That's why. God's funny about that. He gives you something to do. He expects you to do it because it's for your benefit, not for his. I mean, yes, everything we do is for his glory, for his praise, but he loves you. He wants what's best for you. He wants you to live an amazing life full of the riches of his glory. He wants you to have a relationship that is just bursting with experiences with him. And so when he brings something to the table and he says, here, this, I've crafted this for you, It's eating times now, people. Dinner's served. And he'll wait. He's patient. God exists outside of time. He's timeless. He'll wait. We see this with Jesus all the time throughout his ministry. Jesus didn't need to be baptized, but it was the will of his father that he be baptized to start his ministry. It was a symbol, it was fulfilling prophecy. So Jesus was baptized. We see it again in the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? Somebody give me the Lord's Prayer. What was that? What was that? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? Perfectly, instantaneously, no questions asked, no debate, no waiting around, no reading commentaries, no searching through, you know, tons of sermons and listening to other preachers. When God gives you his will, you do it. The time is now. I mean, yes, if God tells you his will and says, I want you to hold off, I want you to discern a bit, that's fine. I'm not saying that you can't discern. That's great. But you know what? I trust you. You're smart people. You know the difference between discernment and procrastination. If it's fear that's guiding you, it's probably procrastination. But if it's a hunger to do his will and to to follow it correctly, it's discernment, so you're fine. But if you just don't want to do it, if it's stubbornness, if it comes from a dark place within you is why you put this off, that's a problem. Dinner time is now. He does it again at the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, we, that's such a hard passage for me. Because here is sinless Christ. And he's on his knees. And he's begging his father. And think about this. God who is all-powerful. God who is all-present. God who can do anything. He's saying... Is it possible that this cup be taken from me? That I don't have to go through what I'm about to go through, the crucifixion, the taking upon the weight of the world's sin, the being forsaken by the presence of the Father. I mean, think about that. And he says that, and he says, if it's possible that this cup be taken from me, that would be, you know, that'd be great. I'm paraphrasing. But what does he follow it up with? What does he immediately say in that prayer? Not my will, but your will be done. Every step of Jesus' ministry is a deference to the will of the Father. Total reliance on being righteous, on doing God's will, when he's told to do it, how he's told to do it. Psalm 46 through 10. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. 
burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, oh my God, your law is within my heart. We think of righteousness as law. Yeah, the commands of God should be in our hearts. But more than just a knowledge of commands so that we can try to say that we're righteous because we do this and do this and do this and we don't do this and we don't do this and we don't do this, there needs to be a desire, a hunger, a craving, a passion, a fervent, just uncompromising, unflinching, just total sold out, zealous, gung-ho attitude. I'm going to do the will of my Father. When he gives it to me, how he gives it, I'm, I'm there, Lord. Here I am, waiting to do your will. Amen? Then we see God's response. This water comes in handy. I always forget water, but Pastor Joe is a wise pastor. And of many years of preaching, he reminds me that water Water is good for one who is speaking. God replies in total blessing and anointing of Jesus in his ministry and the act of baptism of what he's doing, that he is fulfilling righteousness. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. That, talk about an endorsement. I mean, we'd love to have that endorsement. I would love it if I was preaching and I said something and all of a sudden, you know, the, the roof like parted. And the Spirit of God showed up and doves or something flew down, I, I'd be done and say, Can we just put that on YouTube? And that's my ministry. I'm going to go play games with the youth. No more preaching for me. <laughs> Christ's ministry was set to begin, it was, it was ready. And his identity is being confirmed. You know, this is a public profession of doing God's will, and this is a public profession of God saying, this is my son, this is the chosen one, with him I am well pleased. He started right, and then he was given the gift of the Spirit to fulfill his ministry. And it says right after that, and who's preaching next? Mike, are you preaching next? Yeah, buddy. So, Mike, you're going to talk about right after this? That's right. (laughs) Good. Right after this, he's given the gift of the Spirit, and then he's taken by the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit out to the wilderness to be tested. And the only way that he gets through it is by relying on the Spirit, by relying on the Word of God. Now, there's something there for us, and this is what I really want to hone in. Maybe God is calling you to do something. Maybe. Hmm. Let me think about that. Let me rephrase that. God is calling you to do something. You. God is calling you to do something. I promise you this. God is not calling you to be a spiritual slacker. God is not calling you. We sat in youth group and we thought of, of terms. This was, I promise this was related to the Bible. We thought of terms for people who do nothing and floater came up. I didn't want to dig into that one too deep. But floater, slacker, dull, lazy, procrastinator, they all came up. And you know what? If you're not doing the will of God, then that's what you are. That's what you are. You are a spiritual slacker. You are a spiritual procrastinator. If you don't have a hunger in your heart for knowing the will of God so that you can do the will of God, what are you doing? When are you waiting for? I remember being a teenager in church. I remember thinking to myself, you know what? I'll have all the time in the world to do the will of God when I've got my life set. Do you remember thinking that? That wonderful, mythical place 
when your life is all like in order and there are no problems and there are nothing, there's no have-tos, there's no deadlines, there's nothing to worry about. You know, because when, when you're young, you think about life like that. You know, I won't have school, be married, have a house, kids, everything's just going to be easy. How's that working for you? How uneventful is your life? Amen? What, so if you're waiting for that wonderful, peaceful time where life and its problems are, are just down, so you're, you know, you're just abundant with free time so that you can really, hey, then I can give God my full attention. Good luck. Anybody thinking about having kids? Good luck. Good luck, man. <laughs> the time is now, not later. 100% now. Because here's the important part. You're missing out. Every moment of life that you live apart from doing the will of God, you are wasting time. You are missing out. People, I promise you this. Doing the will of God will make your marriage better. Doing the will of God will make your work better. Doing the will of God will bring your family closer. Doing the will of God will heal your heart. Doing the will of God will bring healing in your family. Doing the will of God is what it's all about. So if you're waiting for those things to happen before you do the will of God, you are your own worst enemy. You are shooting yourself in the foot. The time to do the will of God is now. So what will your response be today? Not tomorrow, not a week from now, not after you've thought about it and prayed about it a bit. How about today? We're in church. This is a good place. Today, right now, are you going to do the will of God? Are you going to commit to follow him? Are you going to have a desire to do his will? Oh God, your law is within my heart. God has told you what to do in your heart. Do it. It's time. Every moment that you spend apart from the will of God is not only a sin, it's a shame. Because you are missing out on the richness of experiencing God in his fullness in your life. And if you've experienced that, you know what I'm talking about. It is something that just reshapes your existence and you hunger after it and you search for it and you want it and you crave it and you need it. Find it! Find it. Hunger for it. Quit wasting time. I haven't known you that long, but I love you enough to say that to you. People, God wants you to do his will for your own benefit, not just for his glory. To fulfill righteousness in your life, what step of obedience, what step of submission, what step of faith is God calling you towards? What step do you need to take? And what are you waiting for? We see Christ and we see that when he did the will of God, the heavens opened and the spirit of God poured out on him and he was blessed and he was empowered to do his ministry. Your ministry is waiting your calling is waiting. Your purpose, your identity, who you are, the full, true you is waiting on this. And if you want that, you need to step out in obedience and God will bless you. You will have the anointing of his spirit to do all things through him. To fulfill righteousness in his life. To be a blessing to the body. To be a blessing to your family. To be a blessing to others. To be a blessing to the world. To shine for his glory, for his kingdom, to draw others to knowledge and saving grace of him. It's time. It is time to fulfill all righteousness. If something is holding up the anointing of God's spirit on you, make it right. Do it.
No more waiting. I realize I'm being redundant. There's an old adage in, in uh, Baptist preaching. First you tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you've told them. Right now we're at the I'm telling you what I just told you part. When is the time? The time is now. You know better than I do what's in your heart, what God is calling you to do. That you're either being stubborn about or you're being afraid of. You're not trusting God enough. You know what it is. Let's pray for a second. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you call us to live lives of empowerment, Lord, lives of blessing, lives communing with your presence, Lord, living out of your spirit. Lord, I pray for all of us, Lord, that we would experience not only your joy, not only your forgiveness, not only your grace, not only your mercy, but Lord, we would experience your power in our lives. That you would bring us, Lord, bring us to our knees, bring us to a place where we have a heart that desires to follow your will, Lord, that we hunger and crave to do your will. Now, in its entirety, as it is done in heaven, Lord, let us do your will here on earth. Lord, we praise you in your name. Amen.